Uh, welcome to our LinkedIn Live. Um, I hope you're all excited to be here. Um, we have started this uh, live to really discuss all things in E of ESG. First of all, hello to panellists and viewers um, for taking the time out today to have this really interesting debate. Uh, to give everyone a bit of a kind of overview of why we're having this, um, I'm sure you all know we've seen a huge rise in ESG um, recently, um, both uh, positive and negative. Um, there's been a big shift in consumer demand of the sustainability for companies not to just have it as a PR stunt, but to really deep dive into the sustainability and climate change crisis we've had. Um, despite obviously certain criticisms we've had recently and obviously the scandals in certain European banks, there's actually been a $4 trillion sector investment over the past um, 18 months, which shows just how thriving the, the ESG market is today. And to shed some light, uh, we've invited some of the leaderships of some of the really high-end, exciting scale-ups of the ESG platforms to come in and really, you know, explain to them what their aspects are. So to start off, I guess we can introduce them all. Um, Kim, would you like to start to give a bit of an introduction to yourself? Thanks, Claire. Um, I'm Kim Stroh. I'm a co-founder and chief information and digital officer for Persephone. We do carbon management accounting platform, uh, SaaS based uh, solution for, um, you know, the uh, E and ESG. Right, that's great. And Danielle? Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here talking about such an important topic. Uh, thank you for taking the time. I've worked in clean tech and sustainability in and out throughout a large part of my career, and I've currently been the CEO of Scope 5 over the past year. Uh, Scope 5 was founded on a belief that business could be a force for good and has been evolving the past decade to really help our customers um, simplify their ESG, predominantly the E, uh, data management part of their sustainability. Thank you. Great. And Raphael. Yeah, thanks so much for having us and thanks for tuning in. Um, my name is Raphael Guller. I'm one of the co-founders at Sweep. And um, yeah, we're, we're in the E as well of ESG, I think as all of us. Um, we help large companies reduce their carbon emissions in their business and across their value chain. And, you know, we all know, you know, we're off track and we help companies get, get back on track. That's great. And finally, but last but not least, Ryan. Uh, hi, just want to make sure I've got audio and it looks good. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Ryan Merrill. I serve as the chief impact officer at Handprint Tech. Uh, we're a green tech platform in Singapore, uh, working hard to become the digital infrastructure for the regenerative economy. That is great. And for anyone else who doesn't know, uh, I am Claire. Um, I'm an associate at Storm 4 here, and we specialize in green tech recruitment to help find the best hires for exciting companies like yourselves. Um, so yeah, to kind of get get started, I mean, what I love about this panel the most is that we actually have perspectives from all over the world. Uh, we have both America, Canada, Europe, and Singapore in the APAC market. And I'm very aware that actually across the world, there are many different regulations and regions, um, depending on the government and culture. So I guess I'd love to understand a bit about, you know, what your thought is of what ESG is um, and how you actually define it in your role and how that landscape has changed recently um, in the market. Um, Danielle, if I start with you. Hi, thanks, Claire. Absolutely. I think I think about ESG at a really elemental level. Um, it's really sort of this large number of potential uh, impacts based on the activities that um, sort of span this broad category of environmental, social, and governance. Um, components of a business. And so these can apply to a company based on what that company does and in varying levels of priority. Of course, the ESG impacts uh, may apply broadly such as electricity use in a building, since most companies have buildings, although probably maybe some have, maybe there are some companies with less buildings because of COVID, um, or managing for pay equity in a workforce, for example. But then a lot of ESG impacts are also very elemental and focused to a specific scenario or industry, such as like inorganic fertilizer use in food production. You know, that could be con considered an impact for that industry. And so I think it's really important for organizations to think about ESG um, in terms of how those components components really apply to their particular business and how that might change over time. Uh, and then to basically focus on them um, based on their impact and their influence to affect the positive change. So that's kind of the fundamentals, I would say, how we see it. Um, for the second part of your question, uh, ESG is really kind of a qualifier of many other things, like there's ESG investing, there's ESG this, ESG that. Um, and so 
in that broad uh, qualifying space, I would say there has been quite a bit of change, starting with the harmonization of standards, which is a great thing. We've seen standards uh, that emerged in the late 90s. Um, and uh, so that's a big change that's been happening. We also see an emergence of um, disclosure of regulations uh, popping up around the globe, which is fantastic. Um, and they're sort of all in different steps, but kind of going towards those harmonized standards. But one change that I think is really important is that the demand for managing environmental impacts has finally arrived. It's still really voluntary in terms of a market, but there's much more of a growing awareness that everyone has a role to play. And um, the second piece of this is it's really been driven by a greater understanding, particularly by the people who fund the global economy, um, that there are significant financial risks of not managing for ESG, particularly the E, um, because our sort of global supply of ecosystem services is really something that uh, is an input to our whole economy. And as the our natural systems are becoming much more disrupted by our overuse of resources and, and sort of not managing our, our global supply uh, as well as we should, um, you know, the investment community has really waken up or woken up and is, is really starting to think about this. And and then lastly, because of uh, those two things, I think um, you see a real shift in the ownership of sustainability in a company. Um, and so it's becoming much more elevated and a broader discussion. Yeah, exactly. I think Thanks. Ryan you said in an, a, an early conversation we had earlier this week that you had found that as well. There had been a lot more of a quantified and verifiable aspect within ESG in um, Singapore and APAC with new regulations. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, I, I, I think generally speaking, one, yes, you know, you've got some, some significant advances in reporting requirements in Singapore, which is seen as a leader in the region. So we're starting to see uh, heightened recognition of a wave of uh, advantage uh, to be doing more impactful work from a corporate platform spreading across the region in, in, in Southeast Asia, which is um, uh, late but a uh, really welcome change. I think that the revelation that stakeholders in, in markets are awarding ESG leadership um, at the corporate level is, is growing very quickly and say it's lagging just a little bit behind an even more considerable um, realization that uh, shareholders are increasingly placing um, premium on firms and I think you know, my, the, Kalki already alluded to that, uh, who, who are doing excellent work. So so that's exciting. And, and I think it is generally readily understood as a positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I guess, Raphael and Kim, you know, I think a lot of people see Europe and America being the ones that have the, the most regulations, and but also on the other side, have the stakeholders which have maybe more say than compared to in other aspects. How do you both find that balance between what Ryan was saying with the stakeholder increase to Danielle's actual regulations increase? Yeah, I can go first, Jim, and then I'll pass over to you. But I think, you know, Sweeper on paper, we're a French company. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we've got a remote team across Europe and beyond. But I think for us, it's been really good to do this out of Europe because I think Europe has been leading, you know, the charge in many ways, you know, starting with the, the Paris Agreement in 2015. And, you know, France being one of the first governments that actually mandated um, you know, clear rules on, on how to track you know, for, for the E part in particular. And, you know, we do see it across our customer base as well that there is, you know, I think in Europe, in larger companies, quite often, you, know, you find actually sort of dedicated departments and sort of really um, established teams that are really deep in the topic. Um, whereas in the States so far, we, you know, I think there's much more still sort of, you know, happening in the offsetting space and, and less maybe on reducing your own corporate emissions. But I also think it's it's quickly changing, right? And so I think we probably speak to the SEC regulation that's coming through as well. And so I think um, the U.S. Is, is quickly catching up as well, which is, which is great. Yeah, I do think ESG, is it's no longer a nice to have, and it's no longer just something companies do when they feel like it or want to you know, be seen as good or green. Um, these, you know, the alphabet soup that Danielle alluded to of regulations and reporting standards and all those things are really trying to drive a positive impact uh, in the climate crisis that we're in. And, you know, Persephone, we've got a footprint, obviously, a U.S.-based company, but we're uh, established in Europe and Japan and we're going to Singapore. So we have to look at the landscape holistically. And I think it really does need to be a global 
um, you know, kind of standard, maybe standard is too hard of a word, but we need, you know, we need to start having some consistency in um, how we look at this as a, as a planet. And I think some of the uh, companies that are represented here in the areas that we're in are really going to help uh, drive that, uh, the regulations like what the SEC has done, uh, the EU taxonomy, which I'm sure Raphael could probably spend a lot of time on. Um, all, all those different regulations are really trying to um, you know, hold companies accountable and be able to uh, manage the uh, you know, carbon emissions or the GHG emissions uh, and reduce those overall. At the same time, I think we should be really hesitant to put on rose-tinted glasses and say, um, oh, this is all great. Uh, and it's, it's really important. I just want to clarify that. ESG, at the same time that it's making a lot of progress, it is affecting or driving some, some shifts in resource flows. Um, it's also reinforcing power structures that already exist. And so it's, I think, pretty critical we maintain uh, some real circumspect uh, approach to this emergent, I mean, on the one hand, yes, rationalization is good, but on the other hand, it's, it's really dictated primarily by one power center. And it, we're putting a lot of eggs in one basket. Let's put it in one basket. You know, there was a really nice piece of research by a team at MIT a few years ago looking, essentially making the case that it was the owners of big pools of capital that had a selective incentive to save the and stabilize the house. And that argument is appealing. Uh, because from a collective action perspective, we don't have a lot of other alternatives to think that, you know, Sequoia and BlackRock are the ones who save us because they own the assets on them to, to give a good effort to stabilize uh, losses in natural gas. We're, we're burning the planet out by August every year. So maybe even but we do that. So on the one hand, there is as a that you know that those pools of capital are working up to to potentially work. At the same moment, those pools of capital are still overseeing a global economy that is vastly unequal and uh, and becomes more unequal by the day and has massive blind spots on consumption addictions, meat addictions, and the other uh, eight planetary planetary boundaries. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done and and you can't count on just the solution of the powerful to uh, to solve problems that don't actually appeal to you. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really interesting point. And actually is, you know, one of the limitations I think we've seen is that while these regulations have come in place, which are good, the actual gap is still with the understanding of what you know, the, the environmental aspect is worldwide. And, um, you know, for many, the E and ESG, maybe they still just see is that very traditional fuel coming out of factories um, and don't understand the nuances that come about that entire carbon footprint and also that sustainability footprint, whether it be water usage, finance emissions, all those aspects, and um, which I think is a key aspect to bridge for that next stage of accountability with companies because the public will be actually understand what what they're saying i mean Raphael, what do you think needs to be done to kind of bridge that gap between companies integrity and the public's wide understanding yeah um so i mean and maybe just to, to answer ryan as well i think I mean, on on the esg piece that one of my personal sort of um chance with it as well is that you sort of you're lumping a lot of things together right um, and so you're essentially looking at carbon emissions and child labor <laughs> and it's sort of this big catch-all term and i think because it's so bird's eye view so top level it's kind of easy to just focus on certain things and ignore other things right and so i think that's why it's important that we you know sort of drill into each aspect and you know obviously you know at sweep we have this focus on carbon on the environment and yeah i mean you know of, of course the, the old business adage is you know you can't um you know manage what you don't measure and I think that's true here. Um, obviously, you know, tools like ours help you to, you know, effectively measure. Um, you know, I, I think that's super, super important. And it's, it's a big focus of what we help companies at Sweep. I think there's also this danger that you can just spend, you know, 
a lot of resources measuring and not acting. Right? So I think that's <laughs> maybe an interesting conversation. And then I mean I think when it comes to you know what does E actually cover? What what you know what what is where do the carbon emissions come from? I think for you know for a lot of companies that the big elephant in the room is scope three, which is our indirect emissions. And those are the ones that are shared between companies. Right? And so they're you know your suppliers, your distributors, and you know your activity causes you know, they're causing emissions on your behalf, essentially. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's caused through you and you need to tackle those. And there, you know, carbon is not just a data problem of how you measure it, but it's also very much a network problem. And, you know, you have to find ways on how you coordinate that exercise across companies. I think that's where the, you know, the, the biggest challenge lies. Well, and to tie into what you said, Raphael, and also Ryan, the, a big part of that scope through emissions is your financed emissions and the investments you're making uh, as a company into other companies, you own part of those emissions and those are, um, you know, hard to calculate. You use a lot of estimations and, you know, we have the partnership for carbon accounting financials has, you know, more detailed calculations that can really, uh, help companies, uh, you know, measure that to your point, Raphael. And then, you know, what kind of decarbonization strategies can I build based on my supply chain, um, based, you know, even on my scope one or scope two, but especially uh, that scope three, that's going to end up being a large part of most companies' um, emissions. You know, they, they say that, I, I think my video might have frozen, guys, I'm sorry about that, but they, they say that uh, one of the, the devil's greatest successes was convincing the world that he didn't exist. Uh, and it's, it's pretty critical that we recall here that, uh, the carbon content of the energy stock sits underneath everything we're talking about. And if you can alter your energy mix to not be burning fossil fuels, uh, you know, a very large portion of the return on the effort put into measuring scope one, scope two, scope three emissions and beyond goes away that the core problem here is our energy mix. And yet, if you look globally at what we continue to do in developed economies in terms of subsidizing fossil fuel production, we're, we're paying a lot of attention, studying at greater depths a fractally complex system and continuing to measure and measure and measure. And if anyone has ever looked at, at you know, fractal systems, the, the closer you get, the longer the coastline. And then you measure it with a smaller ruler and the coastline gets larger. And you, smaller ruler, longer coastline. It just keeps going. You can measure till the cows come home. You can measure in, ad infinitum until the planet burns. And as long as you're focused on measurement instead of decarbonizing your energy mix and stopping subsidizing fossil fuel exploration, uh, you, you just have to ask yourself at a, at, as leaders, if you're if you're working on the right problems, uh, so so I, I still wrestle with that tension, and and I, I feel that there there is a role for activism, there is a role for direct engagement, and my one of my largest frustrations with conversations where people want to neglect the G and understand what governance is about, uh, is because if you if you are not engaging with the system of power that you inherited and are not ready to make changes there. Uh, you're going to be stuck uh, with uh, playing in the in the field that has been uh, set by by the incumbents. And in this case, the incumbent uh, power system is is burning the planet up. So you you do need revolutionary change. And as far as I've seen, I don't see very much in ESG as it's being advanced that is turning companies into activists. Uh, so again, I think it's important we we recognize some of the limitations of this construct. Yeah. Well, I, th I think we all have our role to play, right? And I mean, you know, like at Sweep, you know, so we sort of take the, the pragmatic approach to try to tweak the system from within it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm not the Extinction Rebellion person that's gluing <laughs> uh, itself to, the, to the, the bridge, but I'm also glad that, you know, that there's sort of this component to, um, to our movement. Um, I, you know, I mean, I think with E in the end, you know, obviously all this criticism that's being levied at um, ESG investment in particular at the moment, it's quite simple, really, right? I mean, companies need to, measure and disclose that, they need to set their targets and their action plan and disclose that. And then ideally also disclose the investments right, that they um, will put into that. And I think that should really help, um, you know, investors to really assess and not get sort of stuck in, in fluffy language. Um, 
and I, but I completely agree with you, Ryan, that you know, in the end, measuring is just the baseline. It's just the starting point, and it's all about the action. And yeah, I think that's that's really the most important part. And that, that's where I really also think, you know, you need to sort of, you know, understand where it's material for you. And, you know, you do want to measure accurately. And, you know, if you're in the space, you might have heard about spent based versus sort of activity based measuring. I mean, I think you want to understand where your emissions exactly come from, how they're being produced, where it matters, mm -hmm. so that you can, start you can build scenarios and have an action plan and track your progress. But then if you're spending a lot of resources measuring somewhere where it's a tiny amount of your footprint and it doesn't really matter, I think it's essentially sort of a form of greenwashing as well because you're spending you know, your energy in the wrong place and maybe it sounds good, but you're having zero impact. And I think you know, that you know, it's just about disclosure and being transparent about what you actually do as opposed to what you do. I might add a comment too that I do think that having this kind of data and having companies focus on it and having their investors knock on the door and, and starting to demand for that disclosure will sort of help empower the younger generation of employees in these companies to come up with more innovative ideas. And so hopefully we can really sort of foster an internal, um, you know, positive change for the business and the society, uh, you know, even, you know, encouraging companies to be more activist oriented in their, you know, their lobbying or at least more balanced in their lobbying so that we can start looking at the subsidization, subsidization of fossil fuel industry for what it is and where it's coming from, right? So, you know, with that data, we'll, we're giving tools to, to the next generation of employees, hopefully soon enough. Ryan, oh. I think you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, couldn't hear you there, Ryan. I'm with you guys. I mean, I, these are very, <laughs> very important points. I hope not too many generations away because there are not that many more generations of people who can spend their careers uh, measuring instead of acting. So I, like, I really, really am sensitive to what you guys are saying in terms of valuing the difference between measurement and action. And that pivot must be clear. So if you wanna measure something, and I mean, I, I really, really respect a lot of the work being done. The only thing that would really raise issue here is the word exactly. I don't agree with you. I don't think you need to know exactly where your emissions are because the word exactly means infinite attention to ever increasing levels of detail and specificity. And when the sector is competing to do a better job at that again and again and again, instead of competing to do a better job translating those resources into material impact in the world, I think we're missing the, I think we're missing the mission, right? We're getting, we're, we're, we're missing, we're missing the track. Um, when a company spends $100,000 on an ESG report and $50,000 on an impact event, that's obviously upside down. And yet it's amazing how often that happens. Mm -hmm. You have companies all around the country who are spending you know, $50,000 or $60,000 hiring an ESG person to talk about how the company is going to set measurement goals. And they're not spending that $60,000 on actually making a difference for people in the world. So I just think that there is, there needs to be an inflection in terms of a, a drive, if you will, to start to balance reporting with direct action. I, I, I completely agree. Uh, I, again, I think certain areas is good to measure more accurately just to, so you can actually plan and understand how to make change, right? It's all about how, what are my levers where I can start moving things around. And then I think, I mean, I think, I think for, for us as tools, like, you know, as like the, the companies building the tooling, I think it's our role as well to show society and the government that, you know, we can help companies to achieve those targets, right? And I think like, we've talked about systems and sort of being stuck in a certain system and the homeostasis. And I think it's, it's our role as well to show the way forward and that it is possible, which allows then, you know, the regulators to regulate and the companies to follow suit. So I think I completely agree. I mean, this is not just about measuring, that's table stakes. You know, that's where you start and we need to show the way forward on you know, how to take action. But it's a very complex effort to go and understand 300 pages of the greenhouse gas protocol and to know, you know, how do I measure and make sure that I am, you know, transparent and auditable so that I make the right moves. Because if I, if most of my emissions are in, you know, my scope three, it doesn't matter if there's solar panels on this building I'm sitting in. Uh, I really need to understand what my company's activities are and be able to um, make the adjustments that Raphael's talking about to really decarbonize my activities and not just, you know, spend that time or effort in 
something that's not impactful. Um, and I think, Ryan, that's really what your, where your heart is, is you know, like what's the things that companies can do that's the most impactful in, in whether it's using a tool or hiring a expert or, you know, something. Um, it's not easy for most companies to understand um, even where to get started, much less to do it you know, correctly and accurately, at least to some level, to, you know, to your point, you don't have to, you know, measure your emissions in grams. Um, that's, you know, not going to help. Uh, you know, there'd be a lot of time and data and effort uh, that would go to waste in that. But I have to at least have some idea of where the biggest impact I can you know, make as a company to decarbonize. And so I think that's what we're all trying to do with taking the, um, you know, the data that a company has, apply it to a framework, produce information, and then in different ways guide to activities that companies can start looking into and say, oh, I need a better supplier for my, um, you know, my materials, you know, something like that. So. And I think that's exactly what you guys, you know, do so well. I think people outside, you know, of the industry might not realise that what all of your companies have been able to do is prevent this greenwashing of even saying what their E is or what their footprinting is. You know, 10 years ago, the issue was actually people just would say they were sustainable with no report or data behind it. And I think that's the first step we've managed, um, you know, with yourselves to make it that that's not possible. Um, and the next step is obviously what I think we're debating now is then how do you action it? And I think that's what's one of the critiques of ESG has been recently. Um, you know, one of the specific ones I've seen obviously is with carbon credits being called a scam or, you know, ripe with false promises and exaggerated claims, which I think is a big thing we do need to focus on and make sure that all this work, like Ryan, you said, isn't just doing for no answer. And, um, you know, Kim, I'd love to hear your viewpoint on how we can actually make sure that is allowed and what your your take is on carbon credits and if they need fixing. And there, yeah, there's a lot of bad publicity around that because there there are uh, you know opportunities to say that I bought into uh, a project or um, a, you know to purchase carbon credits to make me look like I'm net zero, but that isn't really. It's, you know, it's not helping the way we truly need to help, which is, you know, truly decarbonization levers in the business and the activities that the business has. But we have uh, partnered with a company called Patch because they do have verified projects. And we've had many people ask us, you know, about the, you know, carbon offsets and, you know, purchasing carbon credits. And so, um, you know, Persephone has that available on our website in, you know, our partnership and we're not taking commission from it because, you know, we do think it could be seen as a conflict if what we're trying to do really is drive to uh, company activities. But it is something that if, you know, if a company is going to invest in that or a person, right, you can, you know, go buy a uh, carbon offset as a person, then, you know, let's make sure that those dollars being spent really go to those projects and those projects are verifiable and trusted. Yeah, I, I think the whole offsetting um, conversation could be a whole other webinar. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a big one, of course. And I think obviously there's sort of a conversation around, you know, which offsets are good, which ones are the bad apples. And I think there's, you know, a lot of, you know, startups and Patch, you know, is a really great company as well that are, you know, working on that. Um, you know, at, at Sweep, our, our approach there is, you know, like we always use this example of, of the bathtub, right? So the, the bathtub, um, you know, is full of water. That's the carbon in the atmosphere. And, you know, that's why the climate is too hot. That's why we have the wildfires. And so it's completely full and overflowing. And the massive tap is still, you know, um, <laughs> you know, there's still water splashing into the bathtub. And so if we just scoop out this stuff, you know, by planting trees and investing in, you know, in scaling direct air capture projects, et cetera, that's useful because we need to get rid of that water in the bathtub, but we need to stop the tap, right? Mm -hmm. And so our main, main focus with Sweep um, is that we want to help companies reduce their own carbon emissions, right? So start emitting, uh, stop emitting, um, stop the tap. <laughs> and then, yes, it's just as important that companies support getting rid of the rest, right? And so we, we don't really love that, that net zero concept, you know, at a company scale. Yes, at a planetary scale, scale but at a company scale, I think, 
we want to sort of decouple the two a bit. Make sure you reduce everything you can, and yes, invest as well to help these projects. I would like to say also, just kind of at a higher level, um, it's easy to attack these things. And of course, different players will sort of take advantage of them. Maybe maybe not so, um, not intentionally, maybe just because they don't have the data. Or as Kim was pointing out, this is somewhat complicated science. And so um, if they don't have the data, it's going to be a little harder to have <clears throat> a really trustable market. And sort of market shaping is, is a thing that takes time. And it's really upon all of us to, you know, expect transparency, expect data and integrity. And, um, and even I think these tools are useful directionally, and all of them need to get better. And and it's really upon all of us to expect that and to demand that, you know, as you know, as consumers, as citizens, as governments, as companies. So, um, while greenwashing is, I think, also easy bait for, um, you know, <clears throat> journalist stories that get a lot of attention, I really think it's it's good and it has a function to help us make these markets better. But we can't get overwhelmed with greenwashing. We instead need to show a better path forward, which is that um, making decisions based on data and showing the winners that are doing it right. I think. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I think as well, um, you know, when we were discussing earlier, a big part of greenwashing is the the lack of understanding or transparency um, of that. You know, people, if they don't understand what that is, they don't know fully what it means. You know, often the public can only see this final end and, you know, a grade where a transparency towards every single step is a key aspect. However, you have that conflict of, you know, businesses, especially with scope for emissions. I think, Kim, you're the one who's saying this, don't want to say every single investment or finance. Where do you think that's going to go for, between that, you know, privacy versus transparency debate? Yeah, um, I can start. <laughs> so I, I think... I think transparency is the single most important thing. I think the most immediate thing tools like us can support with. Right? And so I, you know, I, and you know, Claire, you said earlier, right? You know, we've got the greenhouse gas protocol now. There's these standards emerging. You know, the greenhouse gas protocol tells you you need to measure your energy and your purchase goods and services and your investments. You know, as Kim said, but there's so many ways. You know, how you, <laughs> how you can measure within these categories. And so I think in many ways it's still a black box, right? And you can you can measure in many different ways. You can use different factors. Um, and so I think bring transparency and comparability to that, and then also sort of you know creating the the system of of um, you know testing that. And I, you know I think in many ways I think carbon accounting, just like financial accounting, you know you'll have a system where the auditors will review that and then you know give their stamp of approval. And so you know I think that's that's really that's really crucial. Um, and I think there's still a long way to go actually. <laughs> and then you're right that of course you know disclosing all that, I mean, essentially every single business activity causes emissions. And so to measure properly, you need to track all that. And so there is definitely a tension between how can we be transparent in what we've emitted and how we've measured it versus not disclosing too much of our, you know, our, our business, um, internal business um, that we might not want to share with competitors. But Raphael, don't you think that it's going to become very much like your financial reporting in your financial accounting um, and the transparency and the accuracy um, and being able to do it with the same rigor that you do uh, your company's financials. And that's where I think uh, Danielle uh, mentioned earlier, you've seen ESG or, you know, the, the reporting of those type of things move from maybe a small you know, little department into the office of the CFO um, because it's it's moving up into a place equal to uh, your accounting uh, and financial reporting. Um, another uh, thing to think about in terms of privacy versus transparency, I think there's some good models out there that the ESG data ecosystem isn't quite um, as mature as and can can take some lessons from. And so, you know, there are sort of like intermediary orchestrators of like data lakes for the pharmaceutical industry, for example, so that, um, you know, different uh, purchasers, manufacturers and, and buyers of big 
volumes of pharmaceutical products can can stay up to date on the latest products that the manufacturers are letting out. But the orchestrator is managing that, and that's where technology is really. Uh, I don't want to say our you know our only hope, but a technology plays a key role in this digitalization is going to be key, and we have to play um, we have to play that strategy out and and really accelerate that. I believe. Um, also, uh, you know, there's other industry groups that kind of consolidate and address some of those privacy concerns between um, between industries. I um, was an early, I was a founding board member on the Electronics Industry uh, Citizenship Coalition, which turned into the Responsible Business Alliance. And it took us every single meeting, we had to read this, um, you know, antitrust disclosure before we said one word. And, uh, but what we ended up doing was evolving a very strong industry solution to sharing data that was very private, but it was managed by a third party uh, that was trusted, right? And so that allowed the industry to move forward. And I think we need to do that in many different ways for ESG. So it's possible. And then someday blockchain will come along and really solve all of this for us. <laughs> I was wondering when someone was going to drop that. One, one of the I know. Three of Sorry, the I took it. <laughs> I think, I, agree. I think the other thing, again, you know, this this controversial scope three piece, like I think can be really crucial there, right? Because if companies and investors, you know, share part of their footprint, you know, they'll force each other to disclose mm -hmm. and be transparent and calculate properly. And so it's sort of this, mm -hmm. you know, this social mechanism in there that's, you know, going to force everybody to pull along. Right? I really hope, you know, that's where we see carbon yeah. very much in as, a, as a network. And I think that this really can create these mm -hmm. effects that pulls whole industries along. A race to the top, yeah, exactly. might we say. Well, right, I think we can't quite hear you. I've seen you try to um, speak. I know, you, I know you have some really great um, viewpoints on this. Um, I don't know if it's a, if a mute or a mute again. Oh, no, that's fine. We can hopefully, yeah, we can hopefully get, get you back on. Um, I always say we'll be, we'll, will be some of the biggest tech minds, but Zooms and links, I think, fail everyone at some point, but no worries. Um, I know, uh, you know, with Handprint as well, obviously I've spoken with Ryan before, so I think, you know, a big point that he also discussed is actually the ability to work together um, and actually have that transparency where, you know, you're all obviously in different regions and you're all in different locations and a key aspect of having this worldwide standard is then for the companies that are leading it to work together for the standards as well. You know, do you guys think collaboration with other ESG platforms will be important for the future? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think like, you know, obviously we're all here, you know, with the same aim, we wanna decarbonize as quickly as possible and the data needs to travel, right? And again, you know, scope three shared emissions, you know, inevitably, you know, companies will work with different toolings and that can go from, you know, their elaborate spreadsheet that they've been working with for 20 years to an installed SAP system that does all sorts of things to dedicated tooling. And you know, the data needs to travel and we need to have this transparency across the data. And so that's super important. And yeah, I, I, I mean, so it's interesting. We, um, we just had a sort of a working group um, with the science-based target initiative in Switzerland. And we had, you know, Salesforce and Plan A is sort of a local um, carbon accounting tool. And us, we, we, we sat together and we talked about, you know, how could we exchange? data formats um, and to, to make sure um, that data is flowing. I think it's really you know, important and critical. Yeah, I would agree for sure. It's essential. Um, and I think with the with the data sharing then enables such a greater like ability to collaborate and an ability it like it gives you the chance to to see things faster and it builds awareness across the network. Um, I mean, there's so many value drivers to um, sharing data that have actually kind of been proven. Um, BCG put out a good report last year called like um, sharing data to address society's biggest problems or something like this. And so it's happening obviously in public health and they, and they mentioned climate change as well. Um, but besides facilitating coordination, it really just helps spur innovation. And a lot of the things, you know, a lot of these tough decarbonization um, problems that we have to tackle, you know, may may take people from different sectors to come together and come up with an even more innovative approach to something that sitting in your sector silo alone, you may not think of. So um, I think data sharing has a lot of value behind it. And hopefully it'll be sort of a flywheel effect, whereas it starts to happen in certain parts of the ecosystem, everybody just sees it and, and there'll be like a step function. Yeah. 
uh, to getting data standards so that we can share safely uh, and with the right um, level of visibility. Yeah, you know, because this greenhouse gas accounting is, is so complex of a problem um, to be able to do it well for, you know, the myriad of industries, you know, that you see listed in GICs, right? And being, you know, having those uh, deep understanding of the activities of, you know, someone that might be in agriculture, rice farming versus, uh, you know, maybe an EMP company versus an auto manufacturer. Um, and so to say that any one company knows everything about everything, you know, would not be accurate. And so you will find occasions where partnering makes the best solution for a company and to help them solve, um, you know, do the data gathering, do the calculations, do the reporting, and then, you know, work on those levers to reduce their carbon. Yeah, and also I think that's also a good point that, you know, once we actually look at those big, you know, 500 companies, they might get to the point where, you know, they take one of you guys who are the carbon accounting experts, but then there might be a water accounting or, you know, something that is actually a full scope of environmentality. You know, we're conscious it's not just carbon that's the issue, that to merge them all together, you know, they'll actually interlink, whether it be their transport, their water usage. It's much more mm -hmm. than just, you know, turning the lights off in the building when when you leave. Um, and I think especially once we hit to that expanding one, that is going to be such a key point. And, you know, one, no one company will have that, that data. Um, before we go on to our final question, just to all the viewers, we'll do a bit of a QA and a um, afterwards. So if you have any questions, feel free to just drop it in the comments and we'll be able to see them um, after that. Uh, I'm sure the guys love to hear all your thoughts, but, um, oh yeah, Danielle. I just wanted to add on to something you mentioned, Claire. It kind of sparked my, my um, uh, comment around, I think there's a lot of interdependencies in the ESG factors themselves. Um, and so while we're talking about carbon, I think it's really, really uh, another value case for data sharing is to think about carbon's influence on water supplies and water risk and water scarcity. And so I think that's an even bigger piece of, of the data sharing equation is really looking at the impacts across the S and the G um, and, and thinking about that risk uh, comprehensively. So you mentioned water and I was like, oh yeah, of course. Yeah, no, and that actually touches base on, on the final one. Obviously, you know, we discussed how ESG is involved and the state of regulations and collaboration in the current time and also countered some of that, you know, rising concerns. But to try and simplify it, we've all said it's a very, very nuanced thing, but you know, what one aspect of ESG should all companies report on? What what would that be, or what element would you guys focus on? And um, Kim, I'll you know start with you. Uh, yeah, that, that's a hard question. You know, how do you condense ESG and everything that pertains to it into just one aspect? And and different firms are going to have different priorities on what they need to focus on and what are their material issues. Um, and once, you know, they uh, have identified that, then they can pick something to prioritize. Um, you know, for us on this call, we are, you know, really focused on, you know, climate change impact as the principal challenge we've identified needs to be addressed. But that doesn't mean that um, diversity, cybersecurity, other things of, um, you know, the SNG aren't uh, as important or uh, or maybe more important depending on um, you know what the company is doing and where they're at in their life cycle the, Ryan I think we can actually hear, hear you again um, I'm I hope so I, no is that, I have my company laughing this if only we could do this for you in meetings <laughs> it's wonderful to stop talking so it's, 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 a, it's a refreshing change um for us you know our work at handprint it's it's what we do is we do we do peer-to-peer -peer connections between companies and, and and partners on the ground doing work and you know that 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 work a lot of our work initiated working with mangroves community community-based mangrove restoration uh, um, and and it's expanded into social justice work and, and supporting things like ocean cleanups 
and it it's raised for me uh, uh, in effect that you know the 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 farther we lean i mean again I, i'm here with you guys and i really appreciate your patience but there there are problems in valuation and natural easy to solve and the spillover effects of really nice conservation work and really, really high value um you know in sea grasses and peat lands and mangrove estuaries generally there's so much go going on it's so complex and it's such a big, bigger story than carbon sg that is really prioritizing measurement act really fails to have a shot at investing corporate in pr protecting things like biodiversity and biodiversity is critical you can't protect biodiversity because you can't, can't measure its value readily like made a lot of progress on this that means that you're not going to do it and if we look at right it's it's not moving into biodiversity protection and if a, if a high value really boiled down to its carbon equivalent it doesn't get protected uh, but if you that can very readily be understood from a carbon perspective it becomes easy and that's what you presume we're, we're, we're sending ourselves in a trajectory where a lot, a lot of really really beautiful things get protected and do get bulldozed uh, because we're consistently trying to really really complex systems it is the same thing in social justice see a me metric to boil down the life out of a brothel in Phnom Penh and get, get job training so that she can have a different crack at, and you, you try to, to turn that into a dollar figure that you can engage in ESG report um, people try to do it and a lot of really worked on these types of problems to value social gains uh, it's so hard uh when it's when it's sought to be valued ends that it doesn't get invested in and the money doesn't actually move so feel that it bears repeating that a focus on duration of direct impact and a reinforcement of aspiration reality but about positive change is a powerful for motivating resources to move to areas where they wouldn't otherwise end up not because those are or a really valid way to do things but because it's hard to measure it's hard to decide and in addition it's really really impactful for amplifying that impact by inspiring. i feel like the esg work that we've put into metrics quantifications laudable though it might be and i believe it is the wonderful effects that have been brought out tonight um it's not that exciting it's not that dare i say sexy and it's in lo lots of different situations some people off and i feel, feel that if we're trying to re really make change in the economy in time to not mm -hmm. burn we need all hands on the boardroom that's the customers that is as you said when we talk about scope three that is the suppliers that are working together and that means you need a paradigm that brings people together in an aspiration or a resigned to die and ready to work hard anyway state either is good depending on your perspective and there's a very important place for direct positive on impact as opposed to balancing out accounts that some of that, that motivation for lots of different stakeholders and that's what, that's what we're working on and and I really want to bring whatever degree that you can put some of your energy in that space I, I completely agree with that and I think we talked a lot about sort of the you know the, the horizontal connections and transparency but you know we're very much focused on 
empowering your whole organization, right? And democratizing the action and you moving away from you know, one person or one department worrying about this to making this a daily business practice that impacts mm -hmm. every single person, right? I think that's really key. And I think that's where also, I think this conversation, we focused a lot on regulation and, you know, what you have to do. And of course, you know, that, that drives change. At, I think it drives sort of the discourse at the moment, which is a great step forward. But I think where we need and uh, where we which we would like to move the conversation is to, you know, not talking about legislation and compliance, but about sort of, you know, the, the, the amazing potential for change this kind of lock. And so we really think like obviously again we're in carbon, but we see carbon sort of as a as a creative force as well and the catalyst for change. And I think the the good companies are seeing that and you know are starting to fully embrace it, not as a tick book exercise, but as a day-to-day -day business practice that will fuel, you know. Or that will be a force for the companies for uh, you know for, for for decades to come. I didn't want to say fuel because obviously it can phase out the, the, the fuel. <laughs> so I 100 yeah. agree, and I think that's very much through engage engagement, democratization, storytelling, and successes. And okay. I do think you need the numbers to know that you're actually having effects, right? And you know you need to measure your achievements. But yeah, it's it's very much about action and about how we do that. And I think that's what Daniel, Danielle, you said as well earlier, linking to that is having that ability to then engage the younger employees mm -hmm. um, and linking to that is having that the full company be engaged into it. And it's, they will actually be the accountability when they get told by, you know, their directors that they haven't hit it. They'll be the ones to go, well, wait a minute. No, we should be hitting it. And it's it's that engagement is going to really push the force. Do you have anything to add at all as well, Danielle, to kind of what everyone else has said? Yeah, I liked, uh, well, of course, I liked everything that has been said. And um, I do like to think about carbon. Everybody should understand their carbon footprint because it's in every activity we take down to the consumer level. Um, but I think that obviously doesn't need to be a distraction, but more uh, as a proxy for all of the other things that matter, such as biodiversity. And um, <clears throat> I think, you know, talking about enrolling everybody, I kind of go back to total quality management, which may sound kind of boring, but, you know, really transformed most of our manufacturing manufacturing industries. And what we need is total sustainability management at every level. And I mean, the eight pillars of the TQM framework perfectly adapts to sustainability. It's like, put your stakeholders first. They said customers, stakeholders are cust customers are stakeholders, um, but there's a broader bucket now. Um, involve everyone, that's a huge piece of it. Be process focused and um, integrate your systems, networking, share data, we've already talked about that. Um, and do it at a strategic level. Like, don't waste all your time measuring the wrong stuff if you know they've cut down the last you know old growth forests because of some other reason. Like, we need to really operate as a, as a more intelligent, collective, um, you know, force of, of organizations and, and people because we can, you know, we have to figure out what are the constraints and, and not let those stop us. And, and that's where a lot of innovation, I think, stands to come is in policy, collaboration and, and building those networks and then, um, you know, powering those networks with data where it makes sense. Otherwise, powering them with projects that they should just go straight to the project because you don't need any data. It's pretty obvious. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I'm conscious we're um, running um, out of time. So I thought we can kind of get one one question in before. And it's from Anne and it's a really good question. So, so do you have some cases to share where you have to trade off E for S or vice versa? And she says she finds it extremely difficult to decide what should come first out of these letters. I could share a little bit about that because I did work in supply chain um, uh, labor rights for quite some time. Um, I would say I kind of think about this in terms of there's important and then there's important and urgent. And so if you have a labor issue and if people's lives and safety are being um, really uh, diminished or, and you know not in a good way, you really have to focus on the people first. Um, and then you get to different levels of intensity, I guess I would say. And so it's kind of, to me, it then becomes a decision between, is this a short term thing? You know, you think about it in terms of duration. Do you fix this in the short term? Can we fix it in the short term? Or do we just have to keep chugging away in the long term? And you really have to constantly go back and forth because you'll always have, you know, fires, environmental health and safety issues in buildings. You, you have to deal with that emerge, you know, instantly. So I think it's situational and we have to have a muscle to be able to take stock of the risk and the impacts uh, and then be able to pivot back to the other stuff and keep moving it forward. I think also what I would add is, you know, Go ahead. This, Go ahead. Sorry, this whole topic, you know, no, no. is 
it's so hard to navigate, right? And I think there's this tension as a company where you know that you're going to make the first step and you sort of expose yourself and you're going to, you're not going to get it all right in the beginning. <laughs> and, you know, you might, you might feel like you're worse off, right? Because now you've exposed yourself and you get the greenwashing claims and you'll get the, the shit storms. And I think it's just so important that, you know, obviously we all have to make our first steps and we're all on this journey together and we're all learning. And I think, what you need to do as well is just to be really transparent about your intentions and what you know where you're at and what you know you're doing right and where you still have room to grow and just just really be open and transparent and i i also must say i'm amazed you know, i think in in this industry how much companies are ready to share um you know with each other and and, and start to be really transparent i think that's the best way to to navigate these challenges we all make mistakes but you just need to show you know the intent and be transparent about it and learn and it's you know it's not it's you know it's not a destination i think it's it's a journey it's a process and we'll always be on it together uh, in, in our work uh in you know curating and doing you know, work with lots of different partners in the field who are doing phenomenal work in s uh and sometimes in g uh, uh in in different places um i have two insights I don't know if there are insights. Two ideas taken from the work. One, you don't want to make. I mean, I just reinforcing my colleague's point about de you know, democratization, crowds, engaging other people, and giving your stakeholders a vote, so that any of the worst decisions are made in a in in a in a tunnel. So so, so get that decision out of a tunnel. Because oftentimes it's a lot easier to navigate these. Choices choices where you have, have stress tests that underlying assumptions and also you have opportunities to begin to start creating a portfolio. I, again, I'm just railing against the idea that you know, you know, the economist had something the other day. Like, do we need to just throw it on, on carbon? Like, absolutely not. Right. And if you look, look at the other eight planetary boundaries, there's a lot of stress on the planet. And at the social level, I mean, I, I, I would point, so include a portfolio approach, bring in more voices to help you make that decision, and look at power. So much of what goes on in 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 the field, right, where the power supply issue, or whether it's a, you know, it's a, it's a fault line in a society, the situation is having to do with power. Because there are social problems that are, are difficult, unjust. And when you, you can identify social activities that are addressed, Addressing a uh, woman is really being hurt again and again and again. You you have an opportunity to make a big difference, a whole lot of effort. So um, look for the bullies and go after them, and uh, vulnerable folks, and and prioritize them. And maybe you will find that your priorities within the S, uh, and maybe even within the E, and that'll help you do a little bit of both. That's good. Kim, do you have anything to add to that or do you, do you kind of agree with what everyone said there? Yeah, I definitely uh, agree because, and I think what the other only thing I'd add is instead of, you know, really trying to patch a symptom to try and look for a cure. So in Danielle's example, it, you know, if, if someone's safety uh, or, you know, livelihood is threatened, you know, look, deeper than just, you know, maybe that one instance and in, in, in try and make a change that is uh, longer lasting, uh, even if you may have to do something that's, you know, uh, less in for the urgency, but then go back and look if you have systemic problems in any, you know, especially the E and the S, right? That's what, we're, you know, that's what uh, is going to be the most impactful. That's actually a really good point. I mean, even to take a scenario here based in London, uh, we had fires across London due to the, the climate crisis and the heat wave. And that would be an S for that short term for a lot of businesses and the safety. But while that immediate, you know, fire safety needs to be done, the actual long term impact and to cure that is actually linked to the E because if that was fixed, we won't have had that in the first place. So I think that is a really good way of putting it is that, you know, I'm sure for many of them, it's always constantly stopping out the short term fires. But similar to that bath equation, you need to turn the tap off otherwise you're never going to be able to fix it great i mean this is unfortunately all the time we have for today i know we could all probably talk about this for, for two days straight 
Um, but I really appreciate all of you guys coming. And I hope we've actually been able to show not only, you know, the impact and the advancements that we have done within ESG recently and that these companies of Persephone Suite, Handprint and Scope 5 can impact, but also you've actually been able to show a footpath and of what the future is and the actions that can be taken. So thanks so much for you guys to come. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone enjoyed it. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.